The OPP bring charges against a second person in an investigation into Thunder Bay police misconduct. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The former lawyer for the Thunder Bay Police Service now faces criminal charges as the OPP's police misconduct investigation continues. Holly Walburn is charged with breach of trust, obstruction of a public or peace officer, and three counts of obstruction of justice. Walburn's lawyers say they're shocked and disappointed that the OPP decided to charge her, and they look forward to seeing the evidence and defending the case. Walburn resigned in her position as in-house lawyer for Thunder Bay Police Service in April of 2023. She's now the second person charged in an ongoing misconduct investigation against members of the service. The investigation was requested by Ontario's Attorney General more than two years ago. In December, Staff Sergeant Michael Dimini was charged with obstruction of justice, two counts of assault and breach of trust by a public officer. OPP and Thunder Bay Police declined to comment Walburn is expected to appear in court tomorrow. City Council has voted to compel at-large member Rajni Agarwal to undergo training for conflict resolution and emotional reasoning. The training opportunities were presented to Council yesterday evening after a report from the City's Integrity Commissioner found that Agarwal was rude and abrasive while sitting on the board of the Fort William BIA. Basilios Bellows has the latest details from City Hall. Councillor Rajni Agarwal says she is who she is. I was born with this tone, I was given this tone, and I've used the same tone. And unfortunately, some people might think it's offensive. Unanimous approval from City Council requiring Councillor Rajni Agarwal to take part in educational opportunities focused on emotional reasoning and conflict resolution. That decision came after an Integrity Commissioner report regarding Agarwal's behaviour on the Fort William BIA Board which was found to be rude and abrasive. Council opted against the report's recommendation to remove Agarwal from the board, instead choosing the education. The councillor was asked after the meeting which she hopes to take away from the sessions. There isn't really any uh, specific. Um, if we look at other cases that integrity commissioners outside of Thunder Bay have done, there have been board conflicts and they've done education. They've never ever had a report as punitive as the one that came forward from the Integrity Commissioner. This is the second report against Agarwal since November. No other councillor this term has had an Integrity Commissioner report made public. Agarwal continued to challenge the findings, saying communication could have prevented escalation. There was no conversation. And then here's our findings. Mm -hmm. They didn't interview the remaining members of city of, of the, that were still sitting on the board and they, weren't, they didn't look at what was happening. This contradicts both reports, which stated Agarwal was made aware of the complaints and provided adequate information to respond. Other councillors felt that while the education opportunities resulted from Agarwal's report, recent behaviour during meetings proves everyone can benefit. I heard uh, from quite a few people that they're really concerned about our functionality. That's the belief of West Fork Councillor Kristen Oliver, who points to last week's heated meeting and the message it sends the public. There needs to be respect and decorum, especially when we're in, the, in these chambers, and especially when we're working with our city administration. There's uh, you know, little reason to have public shaming, and uh, I think that that just was designed to poke holes in our credibility and the integrity of not just our administration, but as council as a whole. The city budgets $20,000 annually for the integrity commissioner. They did go 25% over budget last year, but the treasurer's office couldn't confirm how much was spent on Agarwal's investigations. Basilios Bellos, TVT News. A 43-year-old man faces multiple charges after crashing a truck into a Southside building early this morning. Thunder Bay police spotted a vehicle leaving a Fort William Road business around 1.30 a.m. with items that appeared to be stolen. After speeding away from police, officers saw the white pickup crash into an abandoned building on Simpson Street. The suspect then fled on foot and was eventually arrested. He faces six charges, including impaired driving and dangerous operation. The Ford government is considering counting student residences and retirement spaces to help meet its 10-year housing target to build 1.5 million homes. The government says it's a prudent move to consider all types of housing, but, uh, but opposition parties say the PCs are trying to fudge the numbers. CTV's Siobhan Morris reports. 
first it was new beds in long-term care, counted towards the province's goal of 1.5 million additional homes by 2031. Now retirement home spaces and student housing like dorms could be looped in too. So what are they going to count next? You know, jail cells? I mean, come on. People need housing, they need homes. The housing minister counters that's exactly what the government's doing. I'm not going to apologize for trying to do better for students. I'm not going to apologize for trying to do better for seniors. Calandra feels that in striving for that 1.5 million new homes goal, variety to help all kinds of people matters. If you're going to build sustainable communities where people want to come and invest, we need to build homes of all types that people can afford. For the Liberal leader, the new qualifications miss the point. The point of building affordable homes is a place where people can raise their families. And you can't do that in a dorm room. And you can't turn, do that in a long-term care bed. There are accusations the government's trying to fluff up their housing stats. It's a cover-up to, to the fact that the government is failing to meet its housing target. An accusation Calandra brushes off. If we're unable to uh, get that accomplished for the people of the province of Ontario, I think it would be highly noticeable. The Premier's continuing to be challenged on how much taxpayer money is being spent on his closest advisors. The Premier's bloated uh, staff, office staff budget, it's $6.9 million, I think it is now. That covers employees on the Sunshine List, earning more than $100,000 a year. Their number and compensation has more than doubled since 2019. 48 of those people make more than the median family income, not individual income, family income. I don't think that's just wrong. I think it's obscene. The Premier has deflected attacks on this, refocusing on tax increases under the former Liberal government. Well, the federal government has earmarked $500 million for youth mental health funding. That was announced by Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland today in yet another pre-budget announcement. It means support for organizations like the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, and College and Institutes Canada to deliver mental health services. It's unclear how much money will come to northwestern Ontario, but Thunder Bay Superior North MP Patty Haidu believes it'll have a significant impact on our region. I would imagine that our chapters will be successful. We know that in our region there are a, a high, there's a high degree of mental health um, concern uh, amongst youth in Thunder Bay and uh, the Northern Ontario region. And we are very fortunate that so many of these different organizations have chapters right in Thunder Bay. So as the budget details come out, I'll be working with the community to make sure they know how to apply, how to make sure that they are actually getting access to those resources. And we'll be looking uh, to ensure that we get every dollar that we can into our region. As a former nonprofit organization executive director, Haidu notes resources are always a major concern. She calls this announcement essential to allow organizations to continue to provide much needed support. Supporting the mental health of First Nations youth is what the Tournament of Hope is all about. The action began yesterday at a number of Thunder Bay venues and the opening ceremonies were held earlier today. Lee Noonan was there. The opening ceremonies for the second annual Tournament of Hope fell on day two of the week-long event. After a prayer and opening drum song, event founder Titus Semple welcomed more than 600 youth from across Anishinaabeaski Nation. According to Semple, registration at the event has nearly doubled compared to last year. You know, having that experience from last year and how great that event was, it's, it's drawn so many people. The tournament was founded as a way to help address the youth suicide crisis gripping First Nations, particularly isolated communities. Speakers addressing the youth all emphasize the importance of taking care of their mental health. You took the time to be here because you're looking for opportunities to not only to play sport, but to do something for yourself. And I acknowledge you for that. And I encourage you to do that. NAN Deputy Grand Chief Bobby Narcisse says it's very important to invest in youth and give them opportunities to engage in positive activities like the Tournament of Hope to instill some of that hope in our youth and our future generations as well, to, to really look at uh, what resources are available. Uh, how can they also uh, participate in uh, creating community-based solutions? You know, many of these uh, youth come from uh, different communities. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for them to really bring back some of these ideas to their, to their home communities. 
In addition to hockey, broomball and volleyball, the event also features a variety of other activities aimed at fostering positive mental health and general well-being. We want to continue it on as a multi-year event where you know, we provide kids with the opportunity to get their driver's licenses to be able to you know, be, attend this career fair that we have happening now, but also to just come out and be kids and have fun. Lee Noonan, TBT News. As anticipation builds for this year's Wake the Giant Music Festival, Dennis Franklin Cromartie students have gotten a chance to spend time with one of the performers. They learn the ins and outs of DJing and music producing and will even help create a song that will be performed at the concert. Jessica Clement has the details. Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School students will once again play an important role in this year's Wake the Giant Music Festival. 18 students are participating in a workshop led by one of the festival's performers, Dan General, also known as DJ Shub, who's helping them create a song that'll be performed at the event. General, who's also a music producer, was at the school on Tuesday sharing his experience and skills with the Indigenous youth. <laughs> The group will spend the next two days collaborating and working on the song. General says he's excited to work with the students. I think any time when you get to work with youth, I think is very important, uh, and especially when it's something like this scale, like uh, when it comes to writing music and being creative. I think that those creative outlets, uh, you don't see too many opportunities, uh, and I think this opportunity is huge, uh, especially when it ties into something like Wake the Giant and being able to get on stage in front of that many people. You know that the, you don't hear that too often. Grade 12 student Tessa Harper says she's grateful to be a part of the workshop. It's not a lot uh, that people get kind of opportunities like this to be so close to people who like do all of this cool stuff. So I was really looking forward to it. We've only been here for somewhere about an hour and I didn't know there was so much to, to DJing. DJ and stuff like that. I've already learned quite a bit even just being here so far. I'm excited to keep learning and working with everybody else. Greg Chomut is a teacher at DFC and organizer of Wake the Giant. He says one of the main reasons for the festival is to connect their students with opportunities that are often seen as unimaginable. So one of the classes I teach is music. It, co it uh, corresponds really well with the idea of a music festival and uh, we try every year to get you know one of the artists or multiple artists that we book for the festival in here at the school uh, working with students. Wake the Giants lineup is anticipated to be announced in early May, with the festival itself taking place in September. Jessica Clement, TBT News. The Salvation Army's 18th annual Journey to Life dinner will feature special guest Jordan Tutu. The 13-year NHL veteran has become a champion for mental health both on and off the ice. The yearly event brings awareness to the work the Salvation Army does for the community. It's a big fundraiser for the organization, with money raised supporting its programs throughout the city. Tutu will speak at the dinner about his personal struggles with mental health and addiction and how to overcome adversity. Journey to Life Center Executive Director Gary Ferguson says this year's event will be one everyone can enjoy. So we're really excited this year to have Jordan Tutu. Thunder Bay being a hockey town, I think it's fantastic to have him here. Uh, he's going to talk a bit about his career. He's going to also talk a bit about his journey with mental health and addiction. Oh, I think it's going to be a great evening. It's an all-ages event, so we welcome everybody to come there. Tickets are $125 or $1,200 for a full table of 10. They can be purchased through the Journey to Life Centre office. Forbidden Romance, catchy songs... And Zombies, the Westgate drama program, is bringing an off-Broadway musical to its Cafetorium stage this week. Zombie Prom will have audiences laughing and singing during its Thunder Bay debut. Let's, Set in the 1950s, the story follows the main character, Toffee, a high school senior who's fallen for the class bad boy, Johnny. He dies... But don't worry, that doesn't spoil anything because he returns to win her back. The production runs from Wednesday to Friday at 7 p.m. in the Westgate Cafetorium. Actress Hayden Chepsik says they've been working on this production since November and are excited for the community to finally see it. It's a big and fun experience and the music is amazing and we've been working really hard. The choreographers that have been helping us are 
have done an amazing job and it's really come together. The music is really catchy and fun, very energetic, uh, and it's got a really good storyline about um, how do we accept each other and love each other um, even when we might not be the same. Tickets for Zombie Prom can be purchased for $15 at Westgate's main office through the school's Facebook page or at the door. And today we kind of had the perfect conditions, Haley, for zombies to be walking around. There was kind of an eerie fog out there, especially in the morning. Yeah, I was going to say a misty, foggy day is perfect for lurking zombies for sure. <laughs> but if you're looking for it in a more romantic sense, I like to think of it as like spring's sigh sure. onto our land. So luckily it was beautiful if you look at the temperatures as we recently saw a high of 9 at around 5 o'clock. And that's about two degrees higher than our average high for this time of year. But our low was around 7 a.m. and that was one degree, so still staying above the freezing mark. And that's why that precipitation really lingers. And uh, it's been misty throughout the day and mostly cloudy even when it hasn't had high humidity as the humidity is slowly dropping. But uh, we do still have chances of some mist continuing into the night. But for our region right now, we saw similar conditions throughout the day in Red Lake. They saw light rain, but that's cleared around 3 o'clock. And so now they're under mostly cloudy skies with 8 degrees right now. Kenora saw a little bit of sporadic light rain as well. Sioux Lookout saw more of a drizzle. But uh, that's cleared and is more of a, a cloudy sky as well. They're at 5. Dryden's at 5, and they were mostly cloudy for most of the day. And that kind of foggy haze continued throughout the region. Fort Francis is overcast right now. They're at 8 degrees. And then up in Armstrong, they had some clouds and misty coverage as well, and a little bit of light rain. They are currently at 6 degrees. Greenstone overcast as well. They saw some rain around their lunch hour kind of on and off and currently cloudy. Marathon 4, 7 in Wawa, and Sault Ste. Marie has had a mostly cloudy day, but they've seen some sun pop out here and there. But actually for this hour right now, they have about an 80% chance of seeing some thunderstorms. It's just that mixture in the air that's causing that high chance. But after this hour, that chance just drops down to about 40%. So if they can get through this hour without any thunderstorms, they may not see it tonight. And they're at 10 degrees right now, but earlier today they saw a high of 13, so quite warm there. And then tonight in Thunder Bay will be another night where we don't drop below the freezing mark. We'll be at 2 degrees as our low. It'll continue to be cloudy like I mentioned and we do have chances of fog patches popping up. Within the next few hours we'll see a 60% chance of showers or drizzle, but that'll drop down to about 40% as well here in Thunder Bay once we get a little bit closer to midnight. So with low winds too, just coming in from the east, it's going to be a pretty relaxing night, a little spooky like you said maybe, but that could be good for maybe a good mystery novel. Uh, absolutely, a mystery <laughs> novel, and hey, we've got the zombies taking the stage yeah. starting tomorrow. So it all fits, it all exactly. kind of rolls together here, absolutely. <laughs> all right, thanks a lot, Haley. All right, let's turn our attention to national news now and uh, federal politics. The inquiry into foreign interference in Canadian elections continues today in Ottawa, and there are some high-ranking members of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's staff who are testifying. We'll have details on that and more right after the break. Can't point to, you know, here's, here's a voter that voted illegally. They couldn't point to a picture of a bus that had showed up and said, that's the bus we're talking about. 